Welcome to Fountain City Church's weekly sermon. Our mission is to multiply families of missional disciples locally and globally, and we hope that this sermon inspires you to do just that. If you live in the Chattahoochee Valley, we welcome you to come and worship with us. Thanks for watching. entering into the holiday season, and we really have been, as a staff, kind of leaning back and saying, Lord, what are you doing right now just in our body in general? Uh, And we want to take the next several weeks to invite you on just a journey toward Jesus. We really sense that out of Psalm 23 that the Lord was inviting us um, into not just a moment, not just a season, but a lifestyle of learning how to to walk with the Lord, toward the Lord in His presence. Uh, And so, This week, I just want to begin that um, as we kind of launch this series. It's just uh, a journey to the King. And all of us, every single person in this room is on this journey toward the presence of the Lord. And Christmas, it kind of crescendos with the, the coming of Jesus. Not just us ascending the mountain to find Him, but Him coming down the mountain to us. But all through the Scriptures, there is this narrative of, of journeying toward God's presence. Biblical history tells us that before Christ was born, there were three kings seeing signs of the coming Messiah who traveled from Babylon to Bethlehem some 900 miles to find him. Can you imagine? Like they saw stars in the sky and through the scripture somehow determined that God was coming to earth. And they, they months in advance, made this plan that they needed to go and to find him. Uh, Scholars say that journey would take somewhere between three and four months. Now, this idea of journeying toward toward the Lord's presence isn't like a new idea. Um, All through the scriptures, you see it kind of played out. Judaism itself was a faith of feasts and festivals. And three times a year, the entire nation was commanded to leave their homes and to pack up all of their gear. And the entire nation was commanded to go to Jerusalem with their families to the temple of the Lord where they could worship. And only there could they give thanks and celebrate and sacrifice and share all that God had done for them. So both in the story of Jesus' birth in Jewish history and also through the nation of Israel, God has commanded His people to leave, to take these seasons of times to leave the ordinary routines and rhythms of their everyday lives and to prioritize His presence. And here at the end of the year, we thought, man, Rather than us speed into the holidays and then like screech on the brakes. Does anybody do that? Screech on the brakes and like, man, we really need to be thankful and enjoy this now. Come hell or high water, we're going to enjoy it, you know? Rather than do that thing where we just sprint into the holidays, we really feel this this slow down spirituality that the Lord's inviting us into to, to find his presence on the journey that we find ourselves in. And to slow our hearts into his pace and his rhythm and to discover what he's up to. Uh, It's really beautiful. He actually commands this in Deuteronomy 16 to his people. Listen to what he says. He says, three times a year, all your men must appear before the Lord your God at the place he will choose. At the festival of unleavened bread and the festival of weeks and the festival of tabernacles. So these were three commemorative times through the history of Israel to look at when God delivered them from Egypt, unleavened bread. The festival of weeks was the harvest, which ends in Pentecost, uh, and the festival of tabernacles, uh, which commemorated that God was with them in the wilderness, and they would set up tabernacles and go to be with him. And no one should appear before the Lord empty-handed. Each of you must bring a gift in proportion to the way the Lord your God has blessed you. And so pilgrimage is in the bones of God's people. And if you are a Christ follower, you recognize that that your faith isn't a destination kind of faith. It's actually this invitation for you to learn how to walk with God every single day. Right? It's not you got saved one day so that maybe you'll go to heaven. It is that you have been invited into this life where the kingdom of God is taking root in you each and every day. And you're learning how to steward His presence. And you're learning how to steward faithfulness and righteousness along a path that is full of obstacles. That is full of obstacles. We don't want to bait and switch you. Following Jesus is not some invitation to the easy life. Man, I wish. I wish. And rather, it is this invitation to walk out the journey of life with the God who redeems all things. 
who brings hope into every situation and every circumstance, who never lets any broken piece stay broken, but he pieces it all back together for his glory. Amen? Um, Can you imagine the time and preparation it would take to pack your family up and to go across the nation of Israel to get to Jerusalem to worship three times a year? Like, Like most families on Sunday morning barely make it to worship. It is a miracle. It is a miracle. People come screeching in, literally screeching in on Sunday mornings. If you stand outside or you're a greeter at the door, which is like a fun thing to do, you should go stand out and just watch like the, the, uh, the, 10, o, the 10 05 people and then the 10 10 people. And it's like an increasing urgency with every wave of people who are coming in. You've just barely made it, right? Like for us, I, I get emails all the time like, you guys have been tardy seven times to school, you know? Like, It's just hard to get the basic things done, much less travel across the country on foot with all of your stuff. And so I just want to encourage you this year that as we slow down, uh, it's going to take some preparation for you to actually think ahead on like, hey, what, what do I not need to do in this season? What are some places where I need to simplify my schedule and slow down so that I can actually reflect on who God is and what he is doing in my life in the season? Uh, and I just want to invite you to a kind of radical generosity of yourself in this holiday season. Really, like when we talk about opening up our tables, we're talking about a radical way to worship. So just say, hey, God, I want to bring you into every single thing, every single relationship. How about in this, in this Christmas season? What if you just adopted a radically generous disposition? You began to give of yourself as a way to say thanks to God. You begin to show your gratitude for how he's blessed you and others, and you celebrate with the Lord and his people. And so this morning, we want to start this journey by looking at the playlist that the Jews would have played on their road trip to Jerusalem. Sound good? How many of you have road trip playlists? Anybody? Come on. Okay, what's the best song on your road trip playlist on the count of three? One, two, three. (laughs) Christina McKenzie went hard with Fast Car. Everybody else just slouched on me. Come on, what's your favorite song on your road trip playlist? Gratitude. What? Gratitude. Gratitude. <laughs> Two of you. Okay, I quit. I'm not going to I'm not going to push this anymore. If if it's my wife's playlist, it's all 60s and 70s, you know, like and she knows every word. She can't tell you who sings a single song, but she knows all the words. Um Every one of us needs a good uh, playlist for a road trip, right? Now, I'm one of those weirdos that can keep the, the radio off for eight hours and just, I, I can. Come on. You know who you are. Love you guys. Just long for silence and solitude. I get it in the car. It's beautiful, man. It's beautiful. A couple years ago, I got to go to Israel with my dad and a couple of other leaders, and uh, my dad was rocking like the 70s music I had never heard. We're going through Old Town Palestine, and there's like 70s American music pumping, and I just felt like, this is it. This is the kingdom. This is what it's all about, you know? (laughs) Well, the Jewish nation, they had a playlist that they went to. Every time they hit this road trip up to Jerusalem, they played the same songs over and over, same order. And they all sung all the lyrics. And it created this rhythm of life. It was something more than just the road ahead of them. They were actually painting the landscape as they went with their words and the promises of God. And these ideas about who he was and who they are because of who he was. That's the beauty of a good playlist is it draws you up into this bigger story. And the nation of Israel has this profound playlist. It's called the Songs of Ascent found in Psalm 120 through 135. And they were full of prayers and songs written by the psalmist, uh, of of unknown psalmist, and Solomon and David, people who had come together and written things that grew out of their heart, out of suffering, out of hardship, out of moments of triumph, out of moments of defeat, these longings to reach out and to grab a hold of the God who was good that they were traveling to on the mountains in Jerusalem. And the goal of these songs is not just to be this background track, but this a way to reframe who we are in light of who God is. You need this playlist. Are you with me? Some of you are in a season right now where you need a playlist that draws you up into the larger story. Because if, if you just take a glimpse of your story, it's too much to handle. But when you can look up and you can find the song of God on the horizon, the song of the Lord that's calling you forward, 
then your heart can be filled with hope. And so rather than go straight through this, we're going to actually kind of henpeck through some of our favorite songs, beginning with Psalm 121. So turn into uh, your Bibles to Psalm 121. If you're not there yet, we're also going to have it on the screen. And we're just going to read through this this morning and trust that God gives us a word. All right. The psalmist writes, I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord. He is the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will never slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is the, your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going both now and forevermore. You know, one of the shocking realities in the Christian life is that faith is not a get out of pain free card. I don't know how it happens. Jesus actually makes this like wildly clear to us that to be his disciple, you must first deny yourself and take up your cross and follow him. Right? So if you had any notion in your mind, this is going to be a, a simple, peaceful journey. And Jesus radically changes that vision for you right out the gate. Hey, if you're going to come up after me, if you're going to be a person who endeavors to become like me and to look like me and to live like me, it is going to demand that you deny yourself. You divorce yourself. Right? I actually can, can denounce myself, reject myself, take up my cross, my tool of self-discipline, of self-sacrifice, of death of self, and follow me. Out the gate, he makes it really plain for us. And then he just continues to reinforce it. In this world, you will have trouble. But take heart, I've overcome the world. If they hated me, they will hate you. They will kill you thinking they are doing good things. Are you with me? Somehow, in our Western, utopian, idealistic mindsets, we hear, I'm going to follow Christ, and this, the seeds of prosperity gospel have trickled in and taken root so that we think that when I follow Jesus, everything is going to get better and sweeter and easier. Now, it does get better and sweeter, and some things do get easier, but the challenges of following Jesus in a world that is anti-Christ and opposed to the gospel never looks the way that we think. He makes it painfully clear to us that, it, that the idea is not that if you're just faithful enough that nothing bad will happen. Now, is anybody else guilty of this? It's like we know it, but we have to know it in hard seasons. We, we know it, but in those moments of crisis of faith, in those moments of hardship and desperation, in those moments of difficulty, I have to remind myself of the truth of God's Word. And the psalmist writes to us that one of the early experiences on this journey with Jesus is facing trouble and then learning where to look for help when that moment comes. That is the landscape of faith is that we are on this journey with the Lord, toward the Lord, and that on that journey, I think there will be no hills or mountains, but they seem to keep coming. And there is a God who is with me, who teaches me how to move across them and over them, and to sometimes in faith declare that they move, and other times to just bust right through the middle of them. But there is a God who is with us on that journey. He teaches us where to look for help when that moment of crisis comes. So the question for us this morning is, where do you look when trouble hits? Seriously, where do you look? The sense that I had in worship this morning is that for many of us, we are looking at the God who is, who is incredible, who is eternal, but there are these giants and obstacles standing in our way. And sometimes it is hard to see over the, the, the peaks of those mountains to see his face. Where do we look when trouble comes? We all have places and people and things we look to when trouble comes our way that we think will fix us or fill us or satisfy the situation. The psalmist actually in a moment of confession says, I lift up my eyes to the mountains. I'm looking to the mountains. Where does my help come from? Hey, help, where are you? I'm in a moment of dire need. 
I'm struggling here. Who's going to help me? Eugene Peterson shines a light on what that verse actually means. He says, during the time this psalm was written and, and sung, Palestine was overrun with popular pagan worship. Much of this pagan worship was practiced on hilltops. Shrines were set up. Groves of trees were planted. Sacred prostitutes, both male and female, were provided. Persons were lured to the shrines to engage in acts of worship that would enhance the fertility of the land, that would make you feel good, that would protect you from evil. There were nostrums and protection, spells and enchantments against all the perils of the road. Do you fear the sun's heat? Go to the sun priest and pay for protection against the sun god. Are you fearful of the malign influence of moonlight? Go to the moon priestess and buy an amulet. Are you haunted by the demons that can use any pebble under your foot to trip you up? Go to the shrine and learn the magic formula to ward off the mischief. From whence shall my help come? From Baal? From Asherah? From the sun priest? From the moon priestess? Listen to them. They must have been a shabby lot. Immoral, diseased, drunken frauds. All cheats. All of them. But shabby or not, they promised help. And a traveler in trouble would hear their offer. This is the kind of thing a Hebrew set out on the way of faith 2,500 years ago would have seen on the hills. It is what disciples still see. It's what you and I still see. A person of faith encounters trial or tribulation and cries out, Help! We lift our eyes to the hills and offers of help, instant and numerous, appear. From where does my help come? From the hills? No. No, my help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. What about you? When trouble comes your way, and it has, I'm sure, every one of us, we could take turns and pass the mic around and talk about our stories. It has, and it will come again. Where do you go looking for help? Do you look for it in a person? Do you look for it in a bottle or in a substance? You have to run to the gas station and get the newest version of Delta 8 or Kratom or whatever the fix is that will just numb you long enough to keep moving? Is it in a hobby or an activity? Is it in money or work or numbing? It's a question we all face, isn't it? Where do I look for help when trouble comes? And at the heart of that question is this scary reality. Bad things happen and we are not in control. Hear me, Th that equation doesn't disappear in Christ. Are you with me? If, if we prepare ourselves for the kind of Christian life where when I follow Jesus, bad things don't happen and I'm suddenly in control of everything, or he is, or hardship won't come, death doesn't come, sickness doesn't come, we've actually um, done a little bait and switch activity on ourselves. And for many of us, I think we have subtly swallowed that pill. And God is teaching us that He is the God who walks with us in the face of those things, not in the absence. And, and that is a sweeter version. This is not a God who just robotically programs out hardship. He's the God who knows how to get into your soul and to walk with your skin and body through hardship. And He doesn't ever leave you. That's why Jesus is commended as the great high priest who empathizes with our weakness. There is something about weakness that God is, he is drawn to walking with you in your weakness. He's not just trying to get you perfect and strong. He actually, he actually loves to come near to you in your weakness. And this journey we call life, if we could put a label on it, it may be weakness. The overcoming, triumphant spirit of God in the face of weakness. That, that is the verdict over much of our lives. Is everybody okay? Yeah. This is the reality of our faith, and it's what God is calling us into. So where do you look? What we need when we face that kind of reality is someone or something stronger than us who can make it all right. That's why we look for hope in things that go past us, transcendent experiences, substances that remove our brains, drink that fills our minds with delusions, experiences and sexuality that cause you a moment of euphoria to cause you to forget. 
We are looking for something that is bigger than us, that anchors us beyond us. The problem is, the psalmist and all the world agrees that those temporary things just don't fix it. They just don't. And in fact, the very things that we would choose to deliver us end up enslaving us. The very things that we think are the turnkey solution to the malady of my soul, the emptiness, the longing, the desperation, the sinfulness, the desire that is broken, the very things that I would reach for as a solution to that issue have this way of tangling themselves about me like vines around my ankles and and barbed wire around my wrist and leave me chained up and enslaved to the very thing that I thought would deliver me. And the psalmist elevates our eyes that the one that we need most is God. See, the truth is, we have a terrible track record at choosing well when it comes to facing hardship. And the Psalms play this out beautifully. In the moment of crisis, the first place he looks is the place where pagan worship's happening. Ooh, I know a quick fix for this. I'm depressed, I actually know what'll fill that. I can drink a fifth of this and it'll go away for a minute. Or I can watch an entire season of some stupid show (laughs) or great show that's just not going to check the box. You get to the end and you have to grieve again that this thing is finished. We almost always tend to choose the options on the hills rather than turning to the one who can heal us. And this might be the very heart, the very definition of what worship is. Who do you look to in times of trouble? Who do you account for in your soul is great enough to handle the circumstance and the situation you stand in? Psalm 46.1 tells us very plainly that God is our refuge and our strength. He is an ever-present help in trouble. Now listen to that. In this moment where you're trying to figure out where do I look? Where do I search? God names himself your ever-present help in trouble. Where do you look in trouble? He says, I am the helper of all your trouble. That that is who I am. Now remember, this isn't some label that we can slap on any old God. Yahweh is introducing himself and how he's different than all the other gods. All other people, all other substances, all other situations. I think sometimes we try to take the things that we attribute to God and we try to put those labels on the things of the world. Have Have you ever noticed that? Like uh, there are places in Islamic culture where at times when we are, when we send teams out, not from this church, but teams that we're related to, we're we're close with, where they would be praying for miraculous healing. And when the person experiences healing, rather than put their faith in Christ, they quickly attribute it to Allah. We can just slap the miraculous, compassionate love of God onto Yahweh. No, no, God is actually telling us how he is different here, that he is an ever present God and he is a helper God if you are looking around saying man where do I put my hope in these times what you need is someone who doesn't disappear when stuff gets tough and someone who actually knows how to help you at the moment of your need and God says I am he I'm the one but let's keep reading what it says in Psalm 46 he says in verse 2 therefore we will not fear though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging hold the phone we were just praying for a god who's going to get us out of the crisis of the moment what does he say in verses 2 and 3 what's he describing the end of the world He's saying, when everything comes to an end, I can still know that he is my ever-present helper. Now, this is a confrontation for us. Listen to me. If we form the kind of faith where God is only good and only ever-present and only helper when he delivers me out of my momentary crisis, but my eyes aren't fixed on the eternal God who ultimately redeems all things and restores all things, then I have a faith that is too fragile to hold me up when when the tides come. Are you with me? Or we will hold his feet to the fire and say, prove it today. You said you're good, prove it today. And I believe that God is inviting us into something that is so much bigger. I want him to help me out of my trouble. But the psalmist writes that we won't fear even if the earth melts. Even if the mountains get swallowed up in the sea. 
My view of God as my helper and protector and deliverer is too short-sighted. Now hear me, this is what the psalmist is inviting us into. That he is the God who peeks into your temporary circumstances and moments. And he is the one that when everything else seems lost, still holds you safely in the palm of his hand. And that when everything on this end, when people look at your life and say, what a loss. That God is working in the depths of eternity to restore all things and that the story isn't over. We are the only people, people of faith, you are the only people who can root your life so firmly in the goodness of God that the worst moment on this side is just a gateway into the presence of the living God. It does not end us. It doesn't swallow us. He says God is the kind of helper who gives us confidence even when everything seems lost. As the psalmist writes, my help isn't in temporary solutions and quick fixes. It's not in the empty promises of men. It's not in the illusion of safety that comes uh, with wealth. It's not the sense of control you get from power and prestige. It's not from those hollow gods on the hills. My help is from the Lord. And He is the God who made everything. It's interesting that He qualifies that right there. He says that He is the Lord. He is Yahweh. It's all caps. Anytime you see all caps Lord in the Scriptures, it is the the name of God. And He's saying that this is what God is like. He is the one who made everything heaven, and earth. I love the logic in that. Any logical people in the room? Like you want to like walk it out step by step and piece it together. The psalmist is giving us a very logical picture here. He says, if my help is from the one who makes everything, if that's where I get my help, if that's where my foundation is, then he alone holds the source code to meet my deepest needs. Any single one of us, if we are looking for some help that extends beyond us, beyond our days, beyond what we can see or feel or experience, if we launch that into any person or place or thing that does not have the fortitude and the capacity to hold it, any created thing, any temporary thing, then our expectations are unreasonable. And many of us, we have unreasonable expectations. Like I I love telling people, welcome dinners tonight, you know. I love telling people, hey, we're going to fail you. Let me just set expectations. <laughs> I just want just to be really clear with you. Best case scenario, we're going to fail you and not mean to. <laughs> and by the way, there's like 160 other people in here who are probably going to do the same. Right? Because if you fix your hope, if you anchor your hope, and you hitch that to Grant or to Christina or to Michael Diney, Especially to Michael, right? Like, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. That was love. Uh, if, if you do that to any one of us, none of us can hold it. None of us. We have to have a hope that goes into the one who created everything. See, created beings and things can't supply that. They are limited by time and space and finality. Perfectly curated homes can't supply that. They can't. If your heart is is set on, if I can just get my house straight, if everything can just be perfect at home, we're going to be good. How's that working for you? How's that going? How's that going for everybody around you? 401ks can't supply that. You've just become a slave to, to the lender. You've become a slave to people who feel like they own you because they have the money to give you. You become a slave to this idea that if you get enough in your account, everything's going to be okay. But the scriptures are plain. Money's fleeting. Here one moment, gone the next. It's not that we shouldn't learn how to steward it and grow in it. It's that it can't be your foundation. It can't. Longer vacations are nice, but they can't supply that. They can't. Government leaders can't supply that. They can't. Whether your guy won or not. Or lady. (laughs) They can't. Are you with me? Where's your hope? What happens when the earth actually does give way and mountains do fall into the sea? We read that like it's poetry. It's not. It's foreshadowing. He's telling us. Hebrews says that the entire earth will be rolled up like a scroll and burned. That the elements will scorch like fire. Everything's going to go away. So is there a God who can hold us past that? How do humans created on this earth exist past the timeline of the earth? 
How do we exist past our family's passing? How do we exist past the point of disease and and hardship and illness? How do we exist past the point of the U.S. economy growing and decreasing and growing and decreasing? How do we exist past kingdoms and nations rising and falling? I'll tell you how. We have a God who stands outside of time and space and who is unaffected, unaffected by the tragedies of men, but he cares deeply and walks with us. The grave, it doesn't hold anything for us. You hear me? Like on on the day that I die, I will be more alive than I've ever been. I used to really bother Chrissy. I would talk about it a lot. It's like, hey, I've got some thoughts about my funeral, you know? And like, she was like, can we please not talk about this? I'm like, no, we have to. She said, you talk about death a lot. I'm like, I think about it a decent amount. In fact, it's 100% certain everybody in here is doing it. You're all going to have that experience. I'm Me too. In fact, the Bible says, I'm not promised that it won't happen tomorrow. I'm not promised that. I hold no promise of the certainty that I'm going to live tomorrow. So I I better live today in a way that makes sense of that. There's this moment where we are going to pass from this life and suddenly we're swallowed up by life. 1 Corinthians 15 says. Now, there is only one who can give me that kind of stability and hope. One. One. And there, there are billions of people around us who do not know that and do not live that way. And when they pass, it will be into utter darkness. And you will pass into utter life. You feel that? I, I dream about those moments. I dream about the times. Like, What does it look like to put your head on the pillow as an old man or as a young man and to dream about the veil lifting between heaven and earth? And for you to suddenly see clearly the things that you could only dream about. To suddenly see the face of God and recognize that He was always here. He was always with me. He's drawing me into this eternal future that is so, it is so accessible and tangible. And it is Him. Are you with me? I have to have a hope and a trust and a hunger that draws me into that image, that future, that destiny that pulls me past just the temporary solution of the moment. We, we, we are a people of hope. We need one who sees the beginnings and the endings and who promises to sustain, sustain us past the perimeter of this temporary life. And David tells us that Yahweh, the creator God, is him. Where do you look for in times of, of need, of trouble? Help, where does my help come from? He says, there is only one who can satisfy the deep longings of your soul and who you are and can uphold you past the perimeter of your own life. Listen to how he shows us. He speaks in traveler language. He says, he will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. He says, God doesn't sleep on the job. Some of you had the distinct feeling. I think Jesus comes to actually confound some of these psalms. Right? Because there are these moments where the disciples are like, you are the son of the living God. And then in the next beat... There is wind pressing against the boat and Jesus is asleep in the ship. (laughs) It's like he's teasing them. Hey, do you know what's true about me? There's some of you here this morning who read this and go, he is definitely asleep on the job. Like that is crap. There is no way that that's true. Some of you, that is a face-to-face confrontation with the God who feels like he has been silent and negligent and asleep. And the psalmist says, hear me. That you can look through the course of this life and you recognize that he who watches over you will never slumber. And even in the moments where you feel like he is asleep. In fact, maybe that's why Jesus said, oh, you of little faith. Don't you remember what you said about me? Can you not connect it here to Psalm 121 that I am the God who never sleeps or slumbers? That I will not let your foot slip? Lord, we're drowning. Are you? I'm with you. There is nothing that can overcome you when I'm with you. It's not that hardship doesn't come. It's not that we don't suffer. It's that God redeems all things and that destruction will not overtake you. He will not let your foot slip. Now, how many of you slip and slide and even fall in following Jesus? Man, isn't that frustrating? Isn't it terrible to sense this like invitation to journey with Jesus and to feel like I'm constantly turning my ankle 
every little pebble. Like I think the hope is the older we get, we turn our ankles less. We, we hit less things that cause us to stumble and to fall. But the promise for us is that we won't ever, it's not that we won't ever fall, but that God who watches over us can pick us up and restore us as though it never happened. Do you hear that? He redeems everything. Everything. He restores everything. Some of you still, you're like measuring your relationship with God based on the past months or years or where you've fallen. Hear me. He says that He forgives your sins as far as the east is from the west. He washes your garments as white as snow. And He will not let your foot slip. God, I just keep screwing this up. He says, get up, come on. Forget about it. I don't even know what you're talking about. How strange of a conversation would it be to have with the Lord? Man, I'm just really sorry about what happened last month. What are we talking about? (laughs) What do you mean? I have this part of my personality. I have a really hard time remembering things. And uh, the good part of that is I don't remember offense a lot. Like, now I'm not saying it's not possible. I'm just saying... (laughs) It's easy for me, for somebody, this happens like traditionally, people will come up to me and say, hey, I'm really sorry about that. I'm like, I don't actually know what you're talking about. I don't remember you saying anything that hurt me. I don't, I didn't feel it. It didn't get in. You know, it, it didn't get in. And I just feel like we would be shocked at the, at the walking journey with Jesus when you turn and say, oh, I'm so sorry. I keep failing in the same spot over and over and over. And him saying, I don't actually know what you're talking about. Like, I really, really love you. I'm so glad we're here. Does that offend anybody? I I find that there's a little religiousness left in me that gets offended when I say it. It thinks, no, no, no. God's like, he needs to teach and correct me right there. Hey, how dare you? And actually, I think the blood of Jesus has accomplished far more than we know or are willing to embrace. Far more. Peterson, Eugene Peterson writes that the promise of the psalm and both Hebrews and Christians have always read it this way. It's not that we shall never stub our toes, but that no injury, no illness, no accident, no distress will have evil power over us. That is, we'll be able to separate us from God's purposes in us. I read, he won't let my foot slip and I think I'll never have to hurt. And what we need to read is that there is no power of our foot slipping that will separate me from God. They will separate me from even the broken ankle I endured from the slip. Somehow being redeemed so that other people don't slip. Somehow being redeemed so that people can look back and see the hand of God over my life in restoring me through a season where I slipped. Can you imagine the Magi on that four month journey to Jesus? How many times they had to break and take a quick nap or sleep for the night? How many dangers did they face being attacked by enemies or wild animals or predators? We don't just need a warrior in the daytime. We need a helper who watches over us when we're vulnerable. Right? Like any of you parents in here, you know the moment when you wake up and there's a child breathing slowly over your face? (laughs) You know what I'm talking about. Some of you are just entering the season with babies. You're not ready yet. (laughs) There There is no terror deeper than a corn silk blonde headed girl standing over you at 4 a.m. breathing over your face. (laughs) It is the grace of God I haven't punched both of my kids. <laughs> Dead in the middle of the night. I wake up out of a jolt and I can feel Nora just lingering over me. It's either a demon or it's my daughter. <laughs> Not an angel. Whatever that presence is, it's freaking me out. And the number of times I'm like, please, God, go to bed. What are you, what's wrong? What are you doing? <laughs> I can't protect myself when I'm sleeping. I can't. I try. It doesn't work. I I need something and someone who can watch over me when I'm most vulnerable, when I can't protect myself, when I'm weak. And he says, do not be afraid. He doesn't take a break watching over you. You know, one of the pressures we face, some some of us carry this sense that, like, if anything bad happens in our lives, we shame ourselves and beat ourselves as though to say, we should have known better. We should have done better. I should have had more sense. Friends, you are frail and and simple. And you can't actually watch your own back all the time. There are mistakes that you will make in this life intentionally and unintentionally. And in those moments, you need the God who never slumbers, but watches over you. 
who protects you and watches over you. Let that sink in. Today, you may feel like your feet are slipping. You may feel a wash in temptation and crisis and weakness, but you are not alone. The Lord God watches over you. Now, can you just take that in for a moment? Because I have this sense that we grow so used to the words that we forget what that actually looks like for us personally. That when you feel most alone and vulnerable, there's a God who is infinitely love and infinitely good, who is around you and over you, sends his angels, his emissaries to watch over you, sends his people to surround you, and he never closes his eyes. And somehow he has this incredible capacity to do that with all of us. As though it was individual. You ever been around that person? It's like, when I'm talking to them, I feel like I'm the only person in the room. The Lord God has his eyes on you and never blinks. He's locked in. I was laughing. Casey and Peyton's baby, Piper, she doesn't blink. I swear she's a robot. Don't tell her. She's the sweetest, most beautiful little robot, but she's, she doesn't blink. There's Casey. She doesn't blink. We were at lunch last week, and I was like blowing in her face to get her to blink. She doesn't blink. I was like, how is this scientifically possible? God doesn't blink. So he doesn't miss a moment when you feel like, I'm about to get swallowed. He sees where every stone is, and he knows how to lead your life. And even when you stumble... To bring you back to a place where as though it had never happened. Verse 5. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. What about the scorching sun or the moon that drives people crazy? In ancient times when you had to travel in the heat of the day, the sun would scorch you and dehydrate you. And literally you would begin to see delusions. And in, moon, in, in the moonlight, when people traveled by moonlight, it was known to give this sickness. They called it moon sickness or lunacy. That's where we get the word lunatic. There was a fear of this journey through the sun and through the moon. There was no safe time. Do you feel it? Terror by day, darkness by night. And he says, you do not have to fear that. The psalmist writes that God is your shade at your right hand. Notice the language. Anybody hear it? What do we hear in that? There's something unique. The Lord is your shade. Not the Lord provides shade for you. Not the Lord holds an umbrella or a leaf over your head. It's not like a Jonah situation where he causes a leaf to grow up over. He says the Lord is your shade. Do you see the picture? Who's really tall? You got a tall person? <laughs> Justin, come here. You're taller than me. <laughs> if Justin and I are walking in the sun of the day, This is just like we read a couple of weeks ago. If I just stand beside him, actually, I'm at his right hand. He's at my right hand. I'm at his left. The Lord. And me. And and the sun is beaming directly over. It is. Yeah. It's just hitting him, hitting him dead in this right temple. What what am I experiencing? I'm actually standing in the full shade. Cool of the day. In the middle of the desert. And he says, the Lord is the shade at my right hand. He's actually the the thing that causes the sun to lose its power to scorch me. Has the sun gone away? Has the threat of danger, devastation, burning, scorching, has it gone away? No. Everyone around you could look and say, you're going to get burned up. And you say, it's actually kind of cool. It's kind of nice here in the shade of the king. Right? Right? Thank you. Y'all give it up for Justin. In Psalm 91, 1, we read this a few weeks ago. It says, whoever dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. You, You live there. You live there. That is where God has invited you to live. Those of you who have given your lives to the Lord recently, that's where he's inviting you to live. So close to him that the things that cause others to burn up and scorch and lose faith and lose heart... You are tucked away in this place where you feel like, actually, it's kind of spacious and airy in here. This is actually kind of perfect. I can go through the hardest seasons and feel the shelter of God coming over me. I can go through the, the most difficult of times and recognize that I am safe in His care. What if, as a people, we trained ourselves to run to His presence instead of running from His presence? 
Have y'all have that experience? Something hits and you can feel it. It's like suddenly you move to a place of separation from the Lord. Y'all know what I'm talking about? I can gauge it. It's like there's an anxiety about coming to Him. There's an animosity or a fearfulness or this hesitancy. Some, suddenly, I will move into coping strategies. I will work and try to like earn my way back. Whatever the thing is for you. Every single one of us is enticed by this idea to run from His presence instead of to His presence. And, and I think that that's actually a sign of performance-based relationship when we choose to run away from God in hard times. Because we think we got to do something to get to Him. Are you with me? We couldn't possibly imagine that God longs to be near to us in our need. Verse 7, the Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going both now and forevermore. Do you hear the refrain over and again? Especially in the older translations. He will keep you and watch over you. He will keep you and watch over you. You know, we don't use that language. He will keep you. He will keep you safe. That's not language that we tend toward. To keep and to watch over. That requires attention and focus and love. God keeps you from destruction. He keeps your foot from slipping. He keeps you from enemies. He keeps you from predators. And He watches over you. He never blinks. His eyes are always on the righteous. He's like a shepherd or a gardener or a lover or a father. He's locked in. And his, his goal is to make sure that this thing is kept safe and watched over. So on this journey with the Lord, remember, we do not serve a God who grows tired and weary. And he doesn't grow tired and weary of you. You hear me? Do you hear me? We serve a God who doesn't grow tired and weary of you. Some of you have been stumbling in sin. Some of you are in a season where you just feel crushed. You feel overwhelmed. And you think he's got to be getting tired of hearing me banging on heaven's door. And I want you to hear me say that God does not grow tired and weary of you, even in your stumbling and falling. He does not turn his eyes away from us because he has better things to do. God does not prioritize us based on who's the most spiritual or who needs you the most in any given moment. He can show up for you in the big things and in the small things, and he delights in it. He delights in it. He works to keep you and to watch over you in every season and in every storm. One more Peterson quote for us today. This one's kind of lengthy. He says, The only serious mistake that we can make when illness comes and when anxiety threatens, when conflict disturbs our relationships with others, is to conclude that God has gotten bored in looking after us and has shifted his attention to a more exciting Christian. Or that God has become disgusted with our meandering obedience and decided to let us fend for ourselves for a while. Or that God has gotten too busy fulfilling prophecy in the Middle East to take time now to sort out the complicated mess we have gotten ourselves into. That is the only serious mistake we can make. It is the mistake that Psalm 121 prevents. The mistake of supposing that God's interest in us waxes and wanes in response to our spiritual temperature. The great danger of Christian discipleship is that we should have two religions. A glorious biblical Sunday gospel that sets us free from the world. And then an everyday religion that we make do with during the week between the time of leaving the world and arriving in heaven. We save the Sunday gospel for the big crises of existence. For the mundane trivialities, the times when our foot slips on a loose stone or the heat of the sun gets too much for us or the influence of the moon gets us down. We use the everyday religion of the Reader's Digest reprint, advice from a friend, an Ann Landers column, the huckstered wisdom of a talk show celebrity. We practice patent medicine religion. We know that God created the universe and has accomplished our eternal salvation, but we can't believe that he condescends to watch the soap opera of our daily trials and tribulations. So we purchase our own remedies for that. To ask him to deal with those troubles, with what troubles us each day is like asking a famous surgeon to put iodine on a scratch. But Psalm 121 says that the same faith that works in the big things works in the little things. And the God of Genesis 1 who brought light out of darkness is also the God of this day who keeps you from all evil. In short, 
No matter where you are today, no matter what you are facing, when you face trouble or crisis or when you feel your feet slipping in the heat or in the heat scorching you and you feel your soul crying out, who's going to help? Know that God, the maker of heaven and earth, has never blinked once watching over you. Is that what you think about when you think about him? You know, we pray it on Sundays quite often because I think it's embedded in us. Lord, I thank you that every time I look to you, I never find your back, but always your eyes. Has that gotten into you yet? That when you turn to him, what you always find is his eyes wide open looking directly at you. His eyes never depart from the righteous, and they are always on those who fear him and whose hope is in his unfailing Love. The question is, do you know the one who loves you and watches over you? You know, one of the things that I struggle with just in preaching is sometimes, you know, we're preaching in a room full of people and all of you are on a spectrum of faith and trust in the Lord. And I'm speaking one message. And it feels sometimes more like an arrow that hits at a specific point on that spectrum. Like if you're at this point of faith and this is how you can... Here's what I want you to hear. that The promises all through the songs of ascent, the promise that God protects you and preserves you and watches over your life, that's actually not for everyone. It's for those who belong to Him. We, we speak sometimes as though the covenant promises of God are available to people who aren't in covenant with God. That's a tragedy. It's, it's like me seeing that someone else has a really good dad and hearing all about this good dad, but me never experiencing that dad for myself and not having the inheritance that comes with that good dad and not having the safety and the structure. You, you feel me? You can see it from a distance all you want, but for some of you this morning, you're just people looking in a window that's not your house. And the Lord is saying, I want you to come and live here. I want you to come and live with me. You're hearing about protection and me preserving you and fighting for your life, but you're just staring through the window. And I'm inviting you to come and take a seat at the table. And I believe this morning that the Lord is just inviting you. And you know if that's you, if you have peace with God in your heart this morning. If when you hear those things, that some of you, your foot has slipped in the last couple of weeks. The sun has scorched you. And you have this hopeful reminder that the God of all creation redeems all things and won't leave that thing be. But for some of you, when the sun scorches, it's just a burn. And when your foot slips, it's just a broken ankle. And there's no hope on the other side of it. And the Lord is inviting you in a place that is firm. That is rooted. That in the midst of your suffering, you know that you have a God who is with you who is the shade at your right hand and who watches over you each and every day. And if that's you today, I just want to invite you to come in the house. The door's unlocked. Jesus says, I am the door. I am the gate. I am the way and the truth and the life. And those who come to the Father, they have to go through me. And this morning, we want the protection and the power of the King in our lives. But it only comes through one door. Why don't you stand with me this morning? Hey, thanks again for listening to this week's sermon. If you felt like the Lord was speaking to you in a specific way, please reach out to us at info at We'd love to partner with you in your faith. Thanks again.